uh, since retirement. Um, he's currently working on curriculum development in Vietnam and India, um, and he occasionally lectures at HSU um, in the ERE and forestry departments. So who said you have to just sit around and do nothing when you're retired? Right? Um, so without further ado, I'll give you Michael Furness, and before we get started, let's give a big round of applause for your blind staff. So, uh, please do that. Okay. All right. Take it away. Okay, well, hello, denizens of the saltwater. Uh, really, a special thanks to Blondies for making something like this happen. You can thank them by buying beer. Uh, don't buy so much beer that you start to heckle me, though, because I have a stick. Uh, so, Ernest Hemingway, uh, was lunching with his friends, uh, maybe at a place just like this, and he bets the table $10 each that he can create an entire story with six words. And after the pot is assembled, Hemingway writes this. He writes it on a napkin and passes it around and collects his wings. Uh, so I'll be using this sort of six word uh, story gimmick to uh, highlight the main points. They won't be whole stories like Hemingway did, but uh, to give you some of the takeaways of the talk tonight. We can drop that a little bit. So in the last two and a half million years, uh, vast continental ice sheets have advanced and retreat retreated dozens of times. With each advance, uh, the amount of water bound up uh, in the ice sheet increased and sea levels dropped. With each retreat of the ice sheets, uh, melt water was released and sea level rose. During this time, the level of the world's oceans fluctuated over a range of about 120 meters, or about 400 feet. And the shorelines have moved uh, in, in landward and seaward uh, tens of kilometers. So sea level change has been part of Earth's history for as long as we know. Um, and so why would we care about it? What would be the problem with it? Um, basically, sea levels have changed very little in the last 6,000 years. And so we assume that they're stable. We assume that they've always been in the same place they are. Um, and this all important line has basically been a given for us, um, fixed and stable and that's not really how the Earth normally works. And we also know that world population has grown just fabulously uh, in the last uh, millennia. Um, you can see there's been an exponential growth of people, and basically the matter with sea level is that we've put ourselves in the way. Uh, more than half the world's population lives within 60 kilometers uh, of the coast because there's fertile land, there's abundant protein, there's navigation and port access, there's usually fresh water, uh, there's mild climates, there's recreation, uh, in the U.S. alone, uh, roughly uh, 34 million people live within a few meters, a uh, few feet of high tide. So here's your first six word, or seas are rising, get ready now. So it's going to go through quickly with you how sea level rise works so that you understand this. And um, you might assume that this is a simple thing, it's just like a bathtub and it comes to a certain level and that's it. And of course it's much more complicated than that, uh, but it's not so complicated you can't uh, pick it up in a, uh, just a few minutes. There's really four different kinds. So there's the global sea level, or what's uh, often called eustatic sea level by the geeks. Uh, then there's a regional sea level for large regions like uh, the, the Western Pacific or the Eastern Pacific. And then there's the very important local or relative sea level. Uh, and then there's a sea level that changes with episodics, uh, or we might call that sea level height variability. And I'll go through each one of these and what controls them for you. So in terms of global sea level, there's two basic controls on that. Firstly, the thermal expansion of water. When water gets warmer, it takes up more space, its volume increases. Uh, and the second one is ice. And um, I once saw a guy give a talk about the ecology of Southeast Alaska, and he, he said, you know, I just can't say enough about ice. <laughs> and that really stuck in my mind. And so it's true, this talk too, I can't say enough about ice. Uh, so it's really the big story here. Uh, and the ice sheets are either melting and collapsing. Uh, and both of those also contribute uh, in a very strong way to sea level. As I've mentioned, the uh, sea level fluctuates over 120 meters, uh, basically with the uh, glacial and interglacial periods, or the ice ages and the warm periods. Uh, and so there's a simple relationship between the temperature of the water and its specific volume. Um, and so this is a relatively easy component for predicting sea level changes. Of course, the ocean isn't the same temperature everywhere, so it's more complex than a simple calculation, but this is quite a tractable projection to make, uh, and it makes a really big difference. And um, as everyone has heard about, I'm sure, as the glaciers are melting, uh, most of the glaciers in the world are receding and, and very quickly, um, and they leave plenty of evidence. We have good records uh, for glaciers, um, and uh, all but a few are, are, are receding in recent decades, 
And when we look at the sea level equivalent that's in the glaciers, so this is not the continental ice sheets, this doesn't include Greenland or Antarctica, it's about this much equivalent sea level. And the uncertainty there is we don't know how much might go into large groundwater basins because we don't know that much about the large groundwater basins. Um, but here's the big story. We have two immense continental ice sheets. Um, these are persistent. Uh, during the warm periods in this uh, two to three million years, when we've had this fluctuation, um, these stick around as far as we can tell. If you go back uh, millions of years, uh, the Earth was warmer and probably didn't have ice sheets, but we've had these ice sheets a long time. Uh, the polar ice cap is sea ice, and it doesn't affect sea level. It's already in the water. But Greenland and Antarctica are continental. There's land underneath them. And when they melt or collapse, they contribute to sea level. The equivalent amount of sea level in Greenland is 7 meters, and the equivalent in Antarctica is 57 meters. Uh, so the Antarctica story is probably the biggest one in terms of how much uh, sea level will change and, and when. And the sea surface isn't flat. Um, so sea level trends are, are not uniform over the globe. Uh, there's various uh, influences of this, uh, heterogeneity in gravity and currents, bathymetry, water temperature, wind, uh, salinity. Uh, large scale patterns like El Nino strongly affect uh, this regional uh, sea level as well. Um, and you can see that there's a kind of a bulge around the equator. Uh, here's a picture of the El Nino condition that we're in now. And if you go to Peru or Ecuador, those low lying coastal areas, uh, are seeing sea level rise because of that warm water that's piling up there. Tens of centimeters of sea level rise. Like in Guayaquil, Ecuador, the coastal areas flood when they have El Ninos just because of the thermal expansion of the water. Uh, likewise, uh, in, the, in Southeast Asia, the uh, sea levels go down. Uh, and unlike uh, in uh, the Western South America, they get a drought. So the equatorial regions uh, also have the greatest sea level because of the rotation of the Earth. There's a bulge around the equator. Uh, and so if you're in the equatorial areas, uh, sea level is greatest. Um, and then here's a gravity effect that I was talking with uh, Dr. Hoyle about. The um, ice sheets are so massive and they're close to the water um, that the, the gravity of the ice sheet actually pulls the water uh, towards the ice. And as the ice melts, uh, this effect will make sea level go down here and rise further in the equatorial regions. Um, and this uh, seems like it would be a small effect. It's not. It's actually quite a large effect. And then our regional sea level well, looks something like this. Um, and I'll mention, uh, I don't think Alderman made Alderman. Uh, He's actually giving another sea level talk to uh, OCSD right now. Okay, yeah. <laughs> sea level is popular these days. So, um, but Alderman Laird and Jeff Anderson have done a, a great vulnerability assessment for our area. And I'll show, I'll show you a little bit of that. Uh, but he has a, kind of a full story on that. And, and uh, Jeff Anderson has developed these, uh, these records. And our regional sea level is about 2.28 millimeters per year of rise. Uh, that's the regional level. That's not what's happening locally, or about nine inches per century. Um, here's another six worder. Land rises and falls affecting sea level. Okay, this is a fundamental concept, and it's something you have to know if you're going to reckon the vulnerability of coastlines uh, to sea level. And so, um, I told you about the thermal expansion and, and the melting and collapse of terrestrial ice. We have all these other factors that actually affect the level of the land. And if the land goes down, um, that uh, exacerbates any uh, global and regional sea level rise. So if the land sinks and the sea level stays the same, you actually see sea level rise because the land is sinking. Kind of a simple idea. Um, and if the land rises, it uh, mediates or counters any, any sea level rise. And so it's absolutely essential to know what the land elevation is doing. And in most places, it's not static, especially here. Um, and so this is our uh, geologic setting here. It's probably many of you know this, but uh, there's a subducting Pacific plate here uh, going underneath the plate that we live on. We find ourselves right here. This is moving all the time, uh, pretty fast, um, but it's usually stuck. And when it's stuck, we have uh, what's called uh, interseismic movement, or the movement of the crust between earthquakes. Um, and we'll show you what that looks like here, uh, thanks to Jay Patton and others. Um, and when the plate is squeezed and then when it re releases and becomes unstuck, the coast seismic, we have also a rapid land movement. Uh, the land elevation uh, changes, and sometimes quite radically. Um, Jay just sent me this graphic a half an hour ago, so I popped it in there. But these, this is the uh, isostasy, or basically the uh, buoyancy adjustments of uh, the crust of the Earth. Um, and where it's red, it's going up, and where it's blue, it's going down. So these areas where it's red uh, are experiencing what's called glacial rebound or isostatic rebound. So 
So the ice was so heavy, we had a mile or two of ice on top of these. And now that it's gone, it's still kind of exhaling and lifting up uh, and rising. And uh, there's parts of, uh, of Alaska here that are clearly outrunning current sea level rise. They're rising faster than sea level, uh, really very fast. And these areas where the ice sheet has just recently left, uh, such as Northern Europe and uh, this Northwest Territories and that here, uh, they're rising very, very quickly, uh, very rapid uh, rates of isostatic rebound. So I wanted to mention sea level rise is a slow process. It's one of the way, reasons that we can deal with this, uh, we can adapt to this, because it takes decades to play out. Um, but earthquakes basically can have the same effect, and they're really fast. Uh, and so we want to be ready for sea level rise the same kinds of things, that many of the same kinds of things that get us ready for sea level rise can also get us ready for earthquakes. And this is what happened in the uh, Japan earthquake in 2011. There was uh, extensive subsidence of the coastal areas. And this is not always what happens to the coast, but typically what happens to the coast in the large mega thrust earthquakes is that it sinks. And you get basically a relative or a local sea level rise in a matter of seconds or minutes. Uh, and uh, everyone knows that is something that can happen here. Um, and so the same kinds of vulnerability um, applies to this very rapid process, which we don't know when it's going to happen, and this very slow process, which we can see happening before our eyes. Uh, and so as I mentioned, it's essential to know what the level of the land is doing in order to reckon this vulnerability to sea level rise. And uh, fortunately, some uh, savvy um, individuals got together and recognized that we would need to know this and need to have it really dialed in. And they set up uh, what's called the Humboldt Bay Vertical Reference System Working Group. And uh, Dr. Jay Patton is here, who's been the spark plug of that. Uh, and they've kind of dialed it down uh, and figured out there's more work to do, but they've kind of figured out what's going on in terms of elevation changes in our area. And what's green is rising and what's red is sinking. Okay, that's kind of a simple story. And so around Humboldt Bay, unfortunately, things are sinking and this exacerbates sea levels. Uh, and then, uh, up here, proportions of the Eel River Delta are uh, sinking as well. Um, I think we need to know more about the Eel River Delta. Uh, but then if you go north of here and all the way up to Crescent City, things are rising, and, and rising pretty fast, really. Um, so the real concern is um, the, the, the area where uh, we are, uh, right around Humboldt Bay, uh, because not only do we have sea level rise, and this is low-lying territory, uh, but it's sinking. Um, and so here are the... Uh, here are some of the data on this. So this is the subsidence levels, Mandarin Slough, North Spit, and Hooked and Slough. And then if you add that to the sea level rise estimates, basically Mandarin Slough is seeing uh, 3.4 millimeters, the North Spit 4.6, and Hooked and Slough uh, 6 millimeters. So it's a fairly complex and uh, heterogeneous picture. Um, so the faster it's sinking, the more serious the problem. And then when you go north from here, we actually have an exas or a, a, a mediated or a mitigated situation uh, because the land is rising uh, and sometimes fairly quickly. So we're, uh, we're diving this down and know this. Um, many places in the world you go, you can, they still don't have this information. They by and large know that they need it, but it's, it's not easy to get. Uh, it takes a lot of very detailed uh, measurements and whatnot. Uh, and so this is being figured out, say, for the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. Um, it's also a very complex place and super vulnerable. So, uh, and then here's just another picture of a satellite picture. So rising, sinking, and rising. And so how would we explain these differences in tide gate reg readings uh, across the U.S.? You can see that all of these in the middle here have about the same slope. Okay, tide gauges are, are noisy because the ocean's a complex place. But Galveston, Texas is going up faster than everything, and Sitka, the sea level is actually going down. So what's going on there? So Sitka is, Sitka is rising and outrunning sea level, and so the local sea level is actually dropping. And Galveston is sinking because of extraction of groundwater and the weight of the infrastructure of the city. It's actually sinking quite fast. They have a huge problem in Galveston, Texas. Uh, and so relative sea level, the local sea level is going up. Um, and so we've got this thermal expansion, melting terrestrial ice, collapsing ice as well, and then all of these influences of the local level. But then we have these episodics that come along uh, at various scales and uh, complicate this and actually uh, make it real in terms of when we actually feel the impacts. Uh, first of all, the El Nino, La Nina cycles, um, they make a difference in complex ways. Uh, the tides, of course, uh, and uh, storm surge. Uh, so when you have storms, that sea level rises for a couple of reasons. Uh, onshore currents, 
and, and wave height and swells. And then I say and so on, because there's a, a bunch of other factors that are less important than this, but I just want to cover it so somebody says, well, what about salinity? So, uh, <laughs> anyway, so all of this is going on uh, to actually figure out what the sea level is going to do in any particular place. And then on top of that, you have freshwater flooding. Uh, in a place like this, the, the Mad River can flood, uh, and this adds to the episodic uh, sea level as well, and also to the inundation of the surrounding territory. Uh, so it's a complex picture. So um, let's take a look at sea levels of the past, and this is really the most interesting thing. And when we look into the past, that tells us, gives us the best kind of information we can get in terms of what's going to happen in the future. Uh, so sea levels leave a lot of evidence. Uh, this is San Clemente Island. Um, and you can see that the wave cut terraces here, these have been uplifted since then, um, but there's wave cut terraces all over the place. You can see them in Fort Bragg, for example. They're kind of covered with trees here, so they're more muted in part of the sea, but um, there's tons of evidence, and it's not difficult to reconstruct the sea levels of the past. One of the cool kinds of evidence is underwater um, carbonate caves. Uh, these can only form on land. They don't form underwater, uh, but this particular one is 100 feet underwater. Uh, and, and you can also uh, carbon date those uh, the, the stalactites and stalagmites and get accurate results on that. Um, we also have a, an esoteric field called underwater archaeology. Um, and this is very expensive to do, uh, so there is, really isn't very much of it done, but you can imagine with this fluctuation of sea level how many settlements and cities have been drowned uh, over time. Um, so there's a branch of archaeology where they go out and, and find these uh, settlements and find these things that are historic beyond six, 8,000 years and try and figure out what was going on there. It's usually covered in mud, it's very difficult to do, and so basically our history doesn't really go back beyond about 6,000 years, and I think it's because of this, because it's so difficult to study. And then we have this marvelous, marvelous tool called ice cores. Um, the ice cores have seasonal markers in them, and they're much like tree rings. You can basically uh, see the progression of, of time in the, in the ice cores, um, and allow us to sample back to about 800,000 years. And a slice of ice can be dated to approximately uh, within three years. Um, and the cool thing is they can turn air bubbles. So they're air bubbles trapped in the ice. Uh, and these can be extracted in, in very fancy, very cold labs. Um, and the carbon dioxide can be sampled directly. So we can see what the carbon dioxide has been doing all the way back that far. Uh, and we can also see what the temperature is doing by a proxy uh, evidence of the two isotopes of oxygen, O16 and O18. And so we have a great record of what CO2 has done over time. We can actually go back almost to a million years now. Uh, and here's what the temperature's been doing, um, and here's what the CO2 has been doing. Um, and this is how we know that the CO2 levels that we're seeing now are higher than they have been in 800,000 years. And that's one of the real drivers for the concern that, that we have worldwide now, that we're going outside uh, the range of, uh, of any kind of recent Earth history, if you think of recent as a million years. Um, so basically, the sea level works as a rough thermometer on the globe. Uh, and if you look at uh, CO2 and temperature and sea level, they track uh, uh, quite well together. Um, and so again, let's look at this ice age and interglacial, or glacial and interglacial periods. Um, and if we look in deep time, for hundreds of millions of years, sea level was much higher, uh, basically because the Earth was a lot warmer, it didn't have ice caps, um, and actually the ocean basins were somewhat smaller. The ocean uh, didn't have as much room, but it had the same amount of water. And so you had a higher sea level uh, many millions of years ago. And then if we zoom ahead to just uh, 500,000 years ago, here is that large wave, basically. And these are the ice ages, and these are the interglacials. Okay, and here we are right here at a warm period, at an interglacial, at a high stand of sea level, basically. And then here's the uh, previous one about 120,000 years ago called the Eden period. And so here's what you came to see if you came for the title of the talk, basically the largest, longest wave. And here it is. We have a good record of it. And the record's really quite good because of all the evidence that this leaves. Uh, and this is what has happened, basically. These are the cold periods. These are the glacial periods when there's a maximum of ice. And these up here are the warm periods. So this is, this is sea level, but it's tracking the temperature of the Earth through time. And the period of these waves is about 100,000 years. So you have a wave that has a, a, a wave height of 120 meters and a wave length of 100,000 years. Uh, and if we zoom in and look at just the last, uh, the, the one full glacial cycle in the past, it looks like this. So 120,000 years ago, we had another warm period. 
it was a little warmer than now, just under two degrees C uh, warmer than what we see now, and the sea level was six to eight meters higher than it is today. Uh, so this, this should be cause for concern. Uh, even without anthropogenic global warming, um, sea level uh, was considerably higher in this last inter interglacial period, this last warm period. And then um, the ice actually accumulates quite slowly, um, and then it melts really fast. Uh, you can see that same effect here. Uh, and then here we are here in this warm period. And we basically know why this happens now. A guy named Milankovitch worked it out, and it's because of uh, small, long period changes in the Earth's orbit. It's uh, the obliquity of the, uh, of the orbital uh, shape, uh, the precession of the Earth through time, and the tilt of the Earth. And the tilt especially matters, seems to matter the most. When the Earth is tilted away from the sun in summertime, the ice uh, can't, doesn't melt much in the north and builds up. Uh, and I, and I, as ice builds up, it reflects more sunlight, the Earth gets heated less, there's a strong positive feedback loop, and an ice age develops. Uh, and then thousands of years later, that uh, shifts and we uh, have the melting and then we have this uh, interglacial period that we find ourselves in now. Uh, so here's another picture of it. The last glacial maximum was just 20,000 years ago. And if that, that sounds long to you, if you have it, if you take geology, if that sounds like a long time to you, it's not. It's really just like a blink of an eye. It's really a very short period. It's just what, you know, uh, you know 500 human, human lifetimes or something like that. It's, it's not much. Uh, did I get that right? Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a short time ago. So a short time ago, the ocean was much, much lower than it is now. Uh, and then we find ourselves here in this warm period. And look at this, this little slack type thing that seems to happen when you get to the top of the warm period. And this plot just blows me away. And this is really the story. If there's one story you walk out of here with, it's this, and that at the last glacial maximum, when things started melting, the rate of sea level rise was crazy high, uh, sometimes as high as four or five, six meters per century. Uh, there were even periods when you'd have a meter of sea level rise in just a few years. Um, and along with that was a crazy jumping climate, a very unstable climate, uh, very uh, low stability, uh, very unpredictable climate. And then about 6,000 years ago, you could say, oh, it looks like more like eight, but it really kind of fully stabilizes about 6,000 years ago. And then it's basically been flat since. Okay, so this is not typical of what the Earth does. We go back to this. This period and this period, these are rarities in Earth's history. Normally what's happening is the sea level is jumping all over the place and changing very, very quickly. But we happen to be in a period, and basically for our recorded history, it was 6,000 years, when we've had stable sea level. Um, and it's a fairly dramatic uh, change. And this is basically when civilization developed. Um, and one could argue that this is why civilization developed, is we have a stable climate, and our coastal cities, which most of the old cities are coastal, um, could stay put. They didn't have to keep getting up and moving. Uh, or they could actually develop cities and civilization and written records and all the rest of it because the sea level didn't change. Well, that has also led to us thinking that um, sea level doesn't change, that it's static, it's just a given. Um, and unfortunately, that's over. Um, this is a picture of temperature changes during that same period. You can see it just matches. So. This is the end of, end of the ice age, and then this long period of basically stable temperature. There have been small fluctuations, um, and you can do whole, you know, you can devote a whole academic career to studying these small fluctuations. But relative to the glacial interglacial cycles, these are very small fluctuations. And so we've had a very stable kind of uh, uh, optimum climate. It's actually called climate optimum by some workers. And so we live in the sweet spot. We live in a time. Uh, and on the coast here, in a geomorphic situation, it is as good as it gets. Okay, and we're used to that, and we think that's just how the Earth is. Um, so, but it's not. We're used to this, but what the Earth normally does is things like this, where it's changing very, very rapidly. Um, so, to picture this as it looks on the coast, we're at, the, at a high, what's called a high stand of sea level, and sea level is about as high as it gets, although it seems to be heading higher now, we expect it to head quite a bit higher. Um, but if you look at, say, 10,000 years ago, the, uh, the ocean level is way out by the continental, uh, the continental shelf, uh, and there's a lot more coastline. Uh, and then this is basically the picture of the wave of the large wave, uh, affecting basically tens of kilometers of coastline. This is what Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific looked like 
Uh, this is what it looks like today, and this is what it looked like during the uh, glacial maximum. So Sumatra and Java and uh, Borneo were all connected. Um, you can see big changes in Australia, big changes in China, big changes in Japan was connected to China. Uh, this is what uh, the Mediterranean looked like. There was still a Strait of Gibraltar, but the Mediterranean was much, much smaller. And, uh, you know, was there an Atlantis? No. There were many, many Atlantises. There must have been many, many settlements that were drowned. Uh, and this is probably the source of the flood myths that you find uh, in most uh, cultures. Um, basically, the, the sea came and swallowed up our town, our city, our settlement. Uh, and it, it had to have happened, but we don't have records of it because it's all under the mud. This is what Florida looks like today. This is what it looked like at the last glacial maximum. This is what it looked like at the Eonian period when sea level was uh, six meters higher than it is today. Uh, so Florida is a good example of uh, vulnerability uh, because it's so low lying. This is what the uh, Alaska land bridge, the land bridge between Alaska and uh, Russia looked like uh, in Asia, and uh, this is how we think the Native Americans uh, made their way in North America. Uh, this is the Red River Delta where I've been working lately. Um, Hanoi is uh, right up in here, and this is a Holocene Delta, basically. This is a delta that formed uh, just a, a short time ago, basically, when sea level was stable. You've got these uh, long-term depositional features going on. And that's recently been mapped, and you can see that just a thousand years ago, all of this land here didn't exist. There's bazillions of people that live there now and lots of very important agriculture, but a thousand years ago it didn't exist. And in fact, if you back up to 4,000 years ago, uh, Hanoi was actually uh, didn't exist either. Uh, and so all of the deltas that you look at across the world and all of the major coastal depositional features are just this old, which is really, really young. And they're, uh, as a result, they're very close to sea level, uh, and they're highly vulnerable. And these are the most vulnerable places on Earth. Um, ours is the Humboldt Bay, which isn't really the delta, but it's a coastal feature that's very young. So how old is Humboldt Bay? It's about 6,000 years old. Yeah. Um, same with the Eel River Delta. And so what did it actually look like at the last glacial maximum here? Danny O'Shea from Humboldt Geology has worked this out. Um, and this, uh, let's see, the blue line here is the 18,000 years ago shoreline. Um, and so it's about 15 kilometers, um, or about 9 miles and change from the present coastline. So if you were here 18,000 years ago, you'd have to walk almost another 10 miles from the beach to get to the, what the door of the beach was then. Um, and I won't dwell on this, but basically when you have a stable sea level, you get very complex depositional features on the coast. Um, that basically make uh, the habitat uh, for uh, people, but also uh, aquatic uh, species and birds and whatnot, as good as it gets. Um, you have these very complex uh, depositional, coastal depositional habitats. Um, and this is, again, this is the sweet spot. Um, and this is uh, probably why uh, civilization developed in this period again. So let's look at some current uh, observations of sea level. So we have the tide gauges all over the place. Uh, and we have these things called the Argo floats. Uh, that, it, it, there's like 3,000 of these things that have been dropped into the ocean, and they're programmed to have this regime of, of dropping down and taking temperature and measurements, and then going down some more, and taking measurements, and then coming up. And when they surface, they report into the satellites, and we've got these huge data sets from the Argo. Um, this is not sea level, but it's salinity and temperature, which are very strong controls on sea level, especially the temperature. Well, but since 1992, we've had these uh, range-finding satellites. It's like a lot of things, we have these fabulous technologies now that enable us to measure things uh, much better than we ever used to be able to. Uh, and these satellites can uh, are, are constantly uh, flying over and taking elevation readings on the surface of the ocean. So we have very good information now on global sea levels. Uh, here's the uh, global ocean heat content. Um, the heat capacity of the ocean is something like a thousand times the heat capacity of the atmosphere. Uh, it's much, much greater. Uh, and so looking at how the heat in the ocean changes is really the most telling. The atmosphere is very, very noisy and changes really fast, and the ocean changes very slowly and kind of integrates these changes over time. So a very small change in ocean temperature is a great concern because it's hard to change the temperature of the ocean. Um, so this is what that looks like. And then if you look at where the heat is going, so all the extra heat capacity that we're introduced to the atmosphere because of the greenhouse gases in that, um, where is it going? Most all of it is going into the ocean. So some of it goes into the atmosphere and the continents and the ice and whatnot, but really the ocean is controlling the picture. And then here is what sea level looks like um, you know, in the last century plus. 
Um, and as you go back in time, it gets more difficult. Uh, tide gauges are difficult to interpret, mainly because of this land level movement thing that nobody really has the data on. Uh, and so there's a lot of noise in there, and then the satellites come along and it's just rock solid information. Um, but this stable period of sea level ended. Um, and the actual sea level is actually exceeding most of the projections. So um, there's been lots of projections through time, and, and what we're seeing uh, uh, with the satellite data especially is that the sea level is actually rising faster than we expected. And you'll remember this graph that shows, notice the slope here and the slope here, and now this just uh, shows you the slope of the current rise in sea level. Uh, and so the stable period is clearly over. Um, and what the Earth is capable of, now this is with a lot of ice sheets melting, of course, but we still have a lot of ice to melt, um, is a much more rapid sea level rise than we're seeing currently, even though that stable period is over and we're seeing significant rise, for example, the nine inches uh, per century that we, that we uh, see here. Um, so that's a picture of what's happened in the past, a real quick picture, um, and what we see as the trend uh, in sea level uh, in our current observations. What do we think is going to happen? Um, and we'll take a break after this section. So you'll recall that there are various uh, temperature increase stories or scenarios that have been put forth, especially by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and they basically have the high emissions, moderate and low emissions. And then these are based on differences in how humanity behaves, basically. How much heat trap and gas uh, we put into the atmosphere and then how this interacts with the atmospheric system and whatnot. So we have this big range of what can happen in terms of what are we going to do? Uh, how much greenhouse gas are we going to emit? And so that has a, a broad range of uncertainty to it. And so these are the sea level rise, SLR means sea level rise. Um, projections from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, their assessment report five, which just came out. Uh, it says 2013, it actually just came out in 2014, it came out last year. And so this is the latest kind of global scientific consensus about what the future looks like in terms of sea levels. And you can see that it diverges uh, considerably depending on uh, different scenarios. Um, and this is one meter here and 2100. So many workers think this is too low, um, but this is the consensus at this point. Um, and they've broken it out in terms of what that comes from. Uh, so here's the, uh, here's the range that they're looking at. And for example, the red is the thermal expansion, uh, and then looking at glaciers and Antarctic water storage and the rest of it. And so you can go to the IPCC assessment report five and see all of this information in the sea level change chapter. Um, and I put this one on here uh, just to show that there is, there's a wide range of projections, but also that this problem is a human scale problem. So in terms of sea level rise, in terms of tides, also in terms of the tectonic changes that we see around us, it's all kind of human scale. Um, and if you would like to know what's going to happen in a particular place around here, go out there during the king tide, or the highest tides we have in a year. I think there's another one, November 24th. When's the next king tide? There's, a, there's an 8.3 coming up in a, in a few weeks. So go out during the tide, stand at the high water, and then the ocean in your lifetime is probably going to come up either here or here. Okay, and then you can look around and see what that would do. So it's a kind of a human scale problem, which is nice. And then I plotted some of the uh, projected sea level rise for different uh, authors. Uh, this is a little getting a little bit old, but um, IPCC assessment report four, which came out in 2007, uh, was widely reported on and it had quite a low number, but IPCC explicitly excluded ice sheet dynamics from their projections because they didn't know how to model them. Uh, and they couldn't agree on how it was to be done, and so they just left it off there. And they said they left it off, but all the journalists missed that and said, this is, oh, we're only going to have you know, this much, and it's not very much, and so you don't need to worry too much about it. But basically, they were missing a big piece of it. Well, they've added that now in AR5, uh, and it's still highly uncertain, but um, there it is. It's, we're looking at, at, at something like a meter of sea level rise uh, by, the, by the end of the century. And then, of course, California always does its own thing. And Scripps Institute, uh, the Pacific Institute, put out uh, these scenarios. And so if you're in California and working for a state agency or doing land appraisals or anything, you're supposed to use these figures because that's the official state scenario. Everyone acknowledges that this might not be right, 
but it's very useful for the purposes of planning and whatnot to have a scenario and to say we're going to plan with this number. Uh, and that number is basically, uh, you know, somewhere between, it's basically 1.46 meters. Um, and, and so it's higher than the IPCC, but lower than what uh, many uh, people that study this think uh, could easily happen. So at four and a half feet, uh, or 1.4 meters for California. That's our kind of official scenario. Uh, yeah, so before we go into ice sheets, and we're going to hear a lot about ice. So you need to put some ice in your beer, I don't know. Um, <laughs> let's take a break. Yeah, the, the, there are many, many feedback loops, both positive and negative, and that's the hard part of climate change. So the radiated physics of additional greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, I'll get in trouble with, with CD if I say it's easy, but it's a tractable problem, like I said, this is how the heat capacity of the atmosphere changes for a given amount of uh, the gases that, that hold heat. Um, the hard part of it is, and, and this is absolutely factored into these scenarios, is how do the feedback loops work? Um, and these are not fully understood. Uh, and there's a great many of them. Uh, for example, clouds are a feedback loop, but they go both ways, they actually cool and warm, uh, and they're not fully understood. And so what IPCC did in AR5 is use, instead of using these cryptic, uh, just numbers that didn't really mean anything for scenarios, they used the RCP, which means representative concentration pathways. It doesn't say anything either, really, but it takes into account what they think the feedbacks will do uh, given a certain amount of radiating force in from the atmosphere changes and how that will change through the Earth system. Uh, but there's all sorts of feedbacks. The classic feedback uh, that you, uh, many of you may know, but uh, when ice melts, uh, when sea ice melts, uh, you go from having a highly reflective surface that doesn't absorb much heat, i.e. ice, to a highly absorptive surface that reflects heat very well, i.e. Uh, the ocean surface, the dark blue ocean surface uh, absorbs heat very well. And so this is a feedback. You warm it up, you lose ice, you warm it up more. And that's one of the positive feedbacks. There are also negative feedbacks. For example, CO2 can fertilize plants and you get a green up. That takes CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, and there's, there's scores of these. Um, and they operate at different time scales. And the degree to which we understand them is quite variable. And many of them are not well understood. And it's another source of uh, uncertainty. slavery, mostly. Um, we solved all sorts of uh, difficult problems. We mostly solved the ozone depletion problem uh, through global cooperation. Um, the outlook, you know, to be as honest as I can be, is not good. And it's horrible. And the despair is, is very real. Uh, and it's something that we have to deal with. Those of us that, you know, study this and then go on to work in it, information, it hasn't really been known since we've been around and since we've been watching it. And when you build models, you need to have empirical information to build the models from and test the models with. And we don't have that, because this is a new phenomenon. It's only just recently been happening. Um, so this rapid melting of Greenland and Antarctica and the collapse of the Antarctic ice sheet um, is, a, is a very difficult problem. And our understanding of it is really in its infancy. Uh, so there was a big story this last week that actually we see more accumulation in Antarctica than we thought. And, uh, but if you look be before that, there was uh, other press releases um, about the Antarctic sheet is collapsing, and it's irreversible. Um, be careful of science by press release. Everybody does it now, and, uh, it, and, and it, 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 the journalists are great, but they typically get this wrong and make it sound like we finally figured this out, and we haven't. It's just another little, little chunk of science to add to this great edifice of unknown uh, that we have about how ice sheets melt and collapse. We really don't understand this yet. There's a lot of work being done on it, and we're, we need to understand it, but it's crazy complicated. There's all sorts of different processes going on, and there's lots and lots of unknowns. So um, 
basically the uh, you have five cu cubic miles of ice in Greenland and Antarctica, uh, and we don't really know how it's going to behave over time. And Antarctica is a very heterogeneous place uh, with the 57 meters of equivalent sea level, uh, and has all sorts of different features that are uh, performing in all sorts of different ways. The ice shelves are very important because they're um, in contact with the ocean. Uh, they're melting very quickly, and when they collapse, they're, they're basically holding back the glaciers that are uh, further up on the continent. And if they collapse and go away, then there's an expectation that these glaciers, uh, the movement of these glaciers into the ocean will accelerate greatly. Um, but this is really the frontier of trying to figure out what the ocean is going to do, what sea level is going to do, is uh, Greenland, but especially Antarctica. Um, and we don't know. Um, and uh, if you see sea level rise projections, um, take them with a little bit of grain of salt. They're the best guess that we have now, there are consensus projections, but there's a lot of uncertainty involved with this. Not just because we don't know how much emissions we'll do, but because we don't know how the ice behaves. Um, and this is what keeps the climate scientists up, you know, or glaciologists up at night, is there could be tipping points, unknown uh, thresholds here, where once it gets going, it really accelerates. And there are mechanisms whereby that, could, that it could happen, plausible mechanisms, uh, where sea level could rise very quickly. And when we look at the record, there actually are meltwater pulses, uh, really rapid increases uh, in sea level uh, that are known to be just rap very rapid melting of ice. Uh, and so we know that the Earth can do this. Um, we just don't know if it will happen to these uh, stable continental ice sheets, formerly stable continental ice sheets. Um, but there's a good reason to worry about it. Don't despair. <laughs> but we worry. We should worry. You're students. You should worry. You know how to worry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the land surface underneath the ice sheets makes a big difference to how they behave. So it's very mountainous underneath it, it'll kind of hold them back, but if it's very smooth underneath them, they'll lubricate with water underneath and slide off into the ocean. But we don't know what the topography looks like underneath the ice sheets. Well, we're figuring that out now. Actually, that's doable, and that's getting done. Uh, so that's, that, that problem is being worked out. Um, but say when IPCC uh, AR4 was done, we didn't have that information. And so sea level rise is slow and long. Okay, it's a very slow thing, and you say that we have a 1970s ocean now. So it takes a long time to react, um, and by the same token, it takes, uh, it, it will last a long, long time. Uh, and so there is a consensus, there is a consensus that um, no matter what we do, sea level rise will continue for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. So we've so thrown the atmosphere out of whack um, that the ocean will be catching up to that effect for hundreds if not thousands of years. So this is happening, and it's not going to stop. Um, so, uh, and that we haven't seen much yet is just because there's there, the ocean uh, warming is such a slow process. So this is just a picture of how much water there is on the Earth. This is the oceans, this is fresh water, and this is lakes and streams. It's uh, basically a billion, billion cubic meters of water. And it's not very much relative to the size of the Earth, but it, it, it's a heck of a lot of water. Um, and as I mentioned, the you know, heat capacity of water is something like a thousand times that of the atmosphere. Um, and so it's slow to change and long to last. Uh, and we're basically looking at uh, the ocean uh, in, in the 1970s. It hasn't caught up uh, with all the emissions and all the changes that we've been seeing in the atmosphere uh, since then. And so almost everything you see about climate change stops at 2100, as if that's the end of the future, you know. Uh, <laughs> But if you think about it, we're not used to projecting things out that far anyway. It's quite unusual to say, what is the world going to look like in 2100, and why should we care? Um, but it won't stop then. And um, if we just project the trend uh, out beyond that, then we, we can see a continuous sea level rise. This is just kind of a linear projection and doesn't allow for the fact that there are a bunch of nonlinear processes and, and uh, thresholds or tipping points uh, that could be hit that could make this much worse. Uh, and so this is just a little depiction of uh, the height, so you can kind of uh, picture it. This is the uh, Sears Tower, I think. Um, and so this is 20,000 years ago at the uh, glacial maximum, and this is where we are now. And if we were to lose all the ice, all of Greenland and all of the Antarctic, which um, is unlikely to happen in, uh, in, in less than several hundred years, perhaps a thousand years, we don't know, um, you have an additional 212 feet of sea level rise. 
and you've probably seen these maps that, 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 that magazines love to publish them. National Geographic had a big one. It's like, what would happen if we lost all the ice? This is what uh, North America would look like. Florida is gone. The eastern seaboard, it's a, it's a very gentle slope, and it's basically gone. Um, we're, we're doing better here, except that our central valley is a very low lying. It would fill with water unless we prevent it. This is what South America looks like. This is what Europe looks like. Obviously, Northern Europe here is, is very low lying. Some of it's under, under beneath the level now, and that's what that would look like if all the ice were gone. And then what about where we are here? Well, that's, this is Blondie's right here, and I just sketched in the 212 elevation line, um, and we're underwater, unfortunately. So you might want to buy your next house up here somewhere, not down here. Um, if you planned a little long time. And then uh, going to the south end, um, sorry about Humboldt State, but it's gone. I think the, the, the top of Founders Hall might clear the water. So, uh, somebody should make a picture of that. I don't know how the, uh, the actual elevations on campus play out, so you can, but you can just look at 212 feet, which is a pretty good number, uh, and figure out how that would play out if all the ice were gone. Again, this isn't going to happen in our lifetimes. It isn't going to happen by 2100. And it might, might not happen for a thousand years, but uh, it could happen. And the Earth has had, uh, for billions of years ago, has had uh, no ice sheets. Um, so general coastlines inundate and steep ones much less. And this has something to do with our vulnerability here and how you might look at vulnerability in other areas. So sea level rise is vertical, but uh, shorelines are mostly horizontal. And so if you have a low, gentle coast, like you have uh, in these big mega deltas of the world, or like on the east coast of the U.S. and southeast of the U.S., a little bit of sea level rise can result in a lot of inundation. Whereas if you're mountainous, like here, and we have exceptions like Humboldt Bay and the Eel River Delta, but most of us are, most of it is mountainous, you have a lot less uh, land inundation, a lot less uh, shoreline advance. Uh, so the average worldwide is for every foot of sea level rise, you have 300 feet of uh, shoreline encroachment. Uh, it's higher in the eastern U.S. and Florida, um, and of course it's much, much lower here. So we can thank our tectonic uplift um, for some of uh, we get a little bit of a benefit out of it because we're essentially, our terrain is basically, with some exceptions, is jacked up uh, by that tectonic uplift. Uh, the overall tectonics raises the terrain here. So it goes up and down, but the overall net effect is that it goes up. Uh, and our terrain is raised up kind of out of the way uh, in some respects, uh, and that's a benefit. Uh, just one thing to mention that uh, just has started to come out. We have a great technology now for land level uh, elevations called LIDAR. We fly over an airplane and do laser uh, distancing, and we get incredibly detailed uh, elevation maps and very accurate, very precise. Um, and when they compare those in a lot of places with the old topo maps, the topo maps are wrong. And they're often wrong in the wrong direction. The terrain is lower than when the topo map was made, or they made errors in the topo map. So um, we need LIDAR uh, all over our coastlines. And we're, we're getting it here, I guess, or we have it now. So um, the topo maps are not adequate. And so this is just a, in the ring of fire. You're probably familiar with it. This is where earthquakes happen much more often than anywhere else. You basically have relatively low vulnerability, because these are areas that are uh, experiencing uh, uplift. Uh, and are sort of jacked out of the way of uh, a lot of the sea level rise. Um, and this is the, we have this huge risk, and uh, it almost feels like a gun pointed at our head that we're, we're going to have a mega thrust earthquake sooner or later here. Um, here's the upside of it, is it makes us, uh, this tectonism that we live with, uh, makes us relatively less susceptible, less vulnerable to sea level rise. Here's the poor Mekong Delta in the southern end of Vietnam. And this is one of the most vulnerable places on Earth. It's a large Holocene Delta. It's just a few thousand years old. And the red areas are what one meter of sea level rise does to it. And this place is loaded with people. There are millions of people live here. And a, a large proportion of Vietnam's rice drop comes from the Mekong Delta. Uh, that's what it looks like from a satellite. And that's what, how people live there. They live in a very intimate connection with the water. And again, you can imagine if this water changes from uh, fresh water to salt water, it really changes your life. Uh, and so there's tremendous concern, lots of work going on in the Delta uh, because of the tremendous vulnerability, the tremendous population that lives there. Um, and another effect there, and it's an effect everywhere really, is that when you put a reservoir in place and hold the fresh water back, then that causes the salt water to come in further and exacerbates this problem. It's not sea level rise, but the fresh water is fighting against that salt water. If you hold the fresh water back or divert it, 
uh, you have less of that going on, and it's a big threat and a big uh, impact mechanism on the Mekong. The Nile Delta, um, this is geologically young, a very dynamic place. There are large populations there. It's very important for agricultural production in Egypt. Um, I'm told that the Egyptians are in denial about the impacts to the Delta. Um, they're not in denial about it anthropogenic global warming, but they're like, not too worried about the Delta because it's, it's going to be decades. Uh, but uh, one meter of sea level rise will uh, seriously inundate uh, the, the whole outer uh, fringe of the Nile Delta. Alexandria, which you know, has all this uh, history, is gone uh, with one meter of sea level rise. So, um, so denial is not just a river in Egypt, you heard that? <laughs> so this is denial of denial. Yeah. So this is before and after. Uh, this is a half a meter, and this is one meter. Um, and so it's very serious, and so the, the Nile is one of the more uh, susceptible places. And it's, if, you, if you want to make a generalization about vulnerability or where the impact of people is greatest in the world, just look to these Holocene mega deltas. Uh, this is usually a ton of people on them, and, and they're very fertile and productive, and they're pulling groundwater out, and they're very, very close to sea level. And so those are the places that are uh, going to be the biggest problem. The Mississippi Delta, for example. Uh, the risks on the uh, south and eastern coast of the U.S. are extreme, uh, much greater than here, uh, because they have a very gentle coast. It's not tectonized. They have very, very low uplift rates uh, and very gentle coastlines. And so they're pretty screwed, really. Um, some people don't want to hear that, but um, it's, it's pretty clear. Um, and then what makes this real, other than the stabilization of the groundwater, uh, is the superstorms. Uh, when you have kind of the perfect storm come along and you have a uh, storm surge, large waves, uh, particularly high tides, what we call king tides here. They don't call it that in the eastern U.S. or anywhere else I've been, but the uh, official astronomical name is perigean spring tides. When the sun and the moon line up, so you have the peak tides. Happens a few times a year. Um, and then freshwater flooding. And this all comes together uh, and, and makes everything worse. Uh, I'll mention storm surge. Storm surge is not the swells. It's not big waves. It's an effect that happens when you have winds that are driving in a particular direction and actually raises the ocean in front of it. You have very significant raises, episodic raises in sea level uh, when you have storms being down on the ocean. And then when you have a cyclone effect, there's actually a, a rise in sea level uh, above the eye. It changes height with uh, barometric pressure, as you might imagine. Uh, and this is the, the storm surge is a combination of these two factors. And that's what really can get you. That's what happened in uh, Katrina and Superstorm Sandy, is that there, because there were hurricanes coming, there was a lot of storm surge. In places in New York, there were like 11 feet of storm surge. Uh, and so you had 11 feet of, of sea level rise just because the storm was pushing the ocean up. A uh, big, big, big factor. Uh, so these things all go together and combine for the impact. And so this is when it knocks down your door, is when these superstorms come along. So this incremental rise and slow inundation of the terrain um, it might not be noticeable or you can kind of roll with it other than our water went salty. Um, but when the superstorms happen, then all these places flood that never flooded before. Um, and so that's, that's when it will really become real, is when you get these perfect storms that come together. A flood, a storm, which kind of, they go together, uh, and then large waves uh, and a high tide, and uh, it's time to move. This is a picture of uh, sea level rise plus flooding uh, in, in the Mekong Delta uh, that uh, Asian Development Bank put together. Um, let's see, uh, Saigon or the Ho Chi Minh, what they now call Ho Chi Minh City, uh, is uh, right up here. And this is just uh, 26 centimeters of sea level rise in a 30 year storm. Uh, and basically, uh, a good proportion of Ho Chi Minh City goes under water. So they're really worried about it there. Um, and there's not a single person saying this is a hoax or anything like that. They just don't, don't do that. It's very refreshing. Uh, they're political class are engineers and scientists, not lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing on lawyers. I love lawyers. You know, I there's lawyers in my family, but they do like to argue. If any of you got into arguments with me, that's why I'm like that. I have lawyers in my family. <laughs> Uh, here's a flood hazard map for Arcata. Uh, these need to be updated, but they're, they're basically okay. But this is, you know, when we have a particularly high tide, this is the areas that would flood now, the blue areas, the green or whatever they are. Um, this is the existing hazard, and then this is if you add 1.4 meters of sea level rise to it. Um, and I'll also mention that um, we'll get back to Arcata because I know everybody wants to know what's going to happen here. People always want to know what's going to happen where I live. Um, but it is notable, the, the 
climate models do not predict more hurricanes, but they do predict more super hurricanes. So they predict more category five, four and five hurricanes. And so we might have about the same number in terms of the best guesses uh, currently, but we will have stronger hurricanes. Uh, there will be an intensification uh, of, of those cyclonic systems. Uh, and so, as I've just mentioned, that's what makes it real and that's what makes the impacts really felt. Um, so let's take a look at sort of the geography of vulnerability across the world. Uh, and as I say, we'll get to our data. Um, so again, here's that sea level rise curve, and this is the onset of this delta formation. And so this, this period of time, the stable sea level, is when almost all of our coastal features formed. And so they're young and they're vulnerable. They're close to sea level. Uh, they didn't have time to build up. Uh, they've only been there for a few thousand years. Um, and these are the, these are the kinds of, of physical types uh, across the world that, that are vulnerable. So we have these, we have little line coastal wetlands, we have tidal rivers, and we also have some soft rock cliffs. Um, and so the atolls are uh, a real problem when these low-lying uh, island nations uh, are uh, super vulnerable and some of them will just be going away in the coming decades. Uh, and you can bet when most folks show up at the COP, they're really um, engaged and they're pretty uh, uncompromising because they stand to lose their entire country. Um, this is what a two meter inundation, this is without storm surge or any of those other effects. This is just looking at elevation and inundation. You have the Orinoco Delta and the Amazon Delta, and there's actually some fairly severe things happening here in Ecuador uh, and Peru. Um, this is Alaska, now there's not a lot of people living on the, uh, the Mackenzie Delta or the Yukon Delta, and actually these places might get a little bit better for salmon uh, with these inundations. <laughs> Uh, this is what happens in Northern Europe and uh, Great Britain. Uh, pretty serious, you know, this is the Thames Delta. And this is what happens in Southeast Asia, really, really very, very serious. This is Thailand here. This, of course, is the Mekong Delta, the Red Delta, and parts of Indonesia, uh, and the Indonesian part of New Guinea uh, are all very, very uh, vulnerable. They're low lying these coastal depositional features, these Holocene features, uh, and this is where the impact will be most strongly felt. The two meter inundation, that's what the sea level, you know, if, well, that's a third of what the sea level rise was at the last interglacial. We had six to eight meters. That's right, yeah, that's right. In the last interglacial period, we had six to eight meters higher sea level without anthropogenic global warming. And so this, you could argue that this is a really conservative number, even though it's greater than the IPCC 2100 projections. Um, this is what happens to Broward County, Florida. Um, Actually, a lot of the inundation is far from the coast. And Florida is really in bad shape because they can't wall the water out. So if you have a lot of money, you can just put up big walls like the Dutch have done and keep the water out. Well, you can't do that in Florida because it's on limestone and it's porous. And it would go right under your walls. And so they don't have that option. I don't care how many hundreds of billions of dollars you have to save Florida. You can't do it because of the rock there. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, for some reason we're not that fond of Florida. It has something to do with Alberta. I don't know. So, who knows where this is? This is the Chow Phraya River uh, going through Bangkok. Um, and guess what? Bangkok is on a Holocene mega delta. It's a mega mega city built on a mega delta, and it is super vulnerable. And so. If we say in 2100, there'll be 88 centimeters of sea level rise, 69% of Bangkok is inundated. And that's without the effect of flooding to the Chao Phraya River, without the effect of subsidence, which is happening like crazy there because of the weight of the infrastructure and the removal of groundwater. Um, and so Thailand's in, in tough shape. Um, and I didn't want to take questions until I can get through all this, um, but you know, hold your questions, because I, I have a few, more, uh, a few more things to cover. I always have too many slides, so I mean, I've got to get through this. So here we are, Humboldt Bay. Um, so basically, here's a meter, two meters of sea level rise and how it looks uh, where we are. Um, and it's not good. Um, we don't have tons of people living there. And we have this thing that uh, has caused great consternation among developers called the Coastal Commission uh, and the Coastal Act, but it has really kept the development of the coasts at a very low level. Uh, and now that this is happening, it's like, oh, well, thank you, Coastal Commission. That's kind of cool. We didn't develop, we didn't put mega mansions all along our coastlines. If you go to Oregon and Washington and you go on the beaches, there's mansions everywhere because they don't have that law. Well, we don't have a ton of people living there. If you happen to live in the Arcata Bottom, some of you I'm sure do, it's not a cheering story. It's going to get soggy there. Um, and after a while, it'll be inundated and you'll have to uh, move up slowly. So, 
Um, here's uh, Eureka uh, with one and two meters of sea level rise. Um, and the slew here and whatnot. Um, and then, as I say, Alderon Laird and uh, Jeff Anderson have done a, a brilliant uh, vulnerability assessment of the bay. Uh, and one of the things they find is that the bay is pretty much uh, in strictures. Uh, the majority of the bay is confined by dikes and levees and railroad right-of-ways and road right-of-ways. And so it's uh, fully restricted. This is the original extent of Humboldt Bay, and then this is what it is now. Okay? And these dikes are really extensive. They were generally built like 100 years ago, and nobody's in charge of them. They're basically on private land. There's no dike, there's no levy district here to look after this. And private landowners can't do it because you might build up your own levy, but if your neighbor doesn't do it, it doesn't matter. So it has to be a coordinated thing because the water doesn't care about the parcel map. Um, but we don't have that in place. Uh, and so this is a big problem. Many of these levees are failing now. Okay, they're old. Um, and when we have a king tide situation like you see here, um, they're failing. They're already overtopping and they're already in the process of failing. Uh, and so the red areas are what Alderaan basically has uh, assessed and said, these are already failing levees. Uh, and the green ones are okay. And then if you add uh, a meter of sea level rise to it, this is what happens to the levees. Um, they mostly all fail. There's a few that uh, stay in place, but they tend to fail. Um, well, if you don't do something about the levees, then um, the bay would basically reoccupy where it used to be. Uh, because the levees are what are keeping it out. Um, you know, we levied everything off uh, in, the, in the early 19th century. We called it reclamation. Uh, we thought this was a good thing to get, get rid of the tidal flats uh, and make productive farmland. Now we realize that these uh, coastal saltwater wetlands are the most productive habitats on Earth. And many of us believe that this is the key to salmon abundance. That having these uh, intact, freshwater, saltwater interface areas, as much of them as possible, is the key to salmon abundance and why we don't have salmon here, why they're on the brink for decades, and why they're still quite abundant in Alaska. They didn't do this in Alaska, but they did it everywhere here. Uh, and Humboldt Bay was no exception. Um, and so what are we going to do about this? Well, the first thing you do about this problem, sea level rise, is you do a vulnerability assessment. Uh, and those are going on all over the world now. Um, and we have it now here. And San Francisco Bay also has a pretty good vulnerability assessments that hit the table. Um, and now we have to sit around and scratch our heads and go, what are we going to do about this? And you know, what's in the way? So what kind of infrastructure? There's actually quite a lot of infrastructure, like Highway 101, that are in the way here, and that are subject to loss or inundation or salinization um, and whatnot. And so we have to figure out what to do with that. And in a moment, I'll tell you what I think we ought to do. Um, <laughs> But there's a deliberative process, and the, the cool thing about this is we have time. Um, there's every reason to begin this now. We're not going to know more anytime soon. Um, but we do have some time to figure this out. Uh, here's another map uh, showing the, the flood zones and what happens in the pink uh, when you add 1.4 meters to it. Uh, here's what I want to see happen. This is my druther, so this is, this is uh, not science. This is uh, preferences or what I think ought to happen. The bay wants to grow. And we ought to let it. Um, the, the lands that are in the way are, are not super valuable. People, by and large, don't live there. Um, there's infrastructure there, but we can move and deal with the infrastructure. Um, and there definitely be losses. I don't mean to minimize the losses that would occur to this. But basically, if you let the bay occupy where it used to be, uh, you'll get much better habitat for salmon and birds and everything else. Um, and all we're doing is we're basically letting the uh, ocean sort of reoccupy places where it already has been. Um, and in terms of the periphery of the bay, most of the impacts happen within one meter. Uh, the, the difference between one meter and two meters is fairly, fairly minor. That's not true in a lot of other places, but it's true here. Uh, here's another inundation map uh, from the north segment. Um, and this is uh, you know, a very, very peak tide, like a 100-year high tide, uh, and a half meter sea level rise. Uh, and so you can see our, our venerable uh, water treatment plant goes underwater, uh, and a lot of the arcade bottom goes underwater as well. So there's some uh, adaptation and reckoning to do here. Um, we're coastal, and this is happening. Uh, here's, uh, again, two meters of uh, sea level rise in a 100-year event. There's no adjustment here for land level change. Uh, so as I showed you, the vertical reference group has shown that these areas are sinking, and so it's actually worse than what you see depicted on the map here. So um, what are we going to do about this? Um, 
And again, here's the artificial shoreline in the areas that will fail uh, if we have one meter of sea level rise, which we're pretty much sure we're going to have. Uh, a lot of our coastline looks like this. So I just would toss this in. This is uh, out in the Mutual. Um, is this vulnerable? You know, we don't have houses there. We don't have power lines. We don't have highways. Uh, but we do have slopes. And uh, clearly, the erosion rate on these slopes will increase as sea level rises because uh, the impingement of the, of the surface is why these look the way they do now. Uh, and it will impinge a little bit further. So, uh, and basically, if you anticipate change, uh, there'll be less suffering. Uh, and so if you wait for it to break down the door and do something like Hurricane Katrina, Superstorm Standing, you have a lot more suffering, a lot more expense, a lot more economic loss uh, when you just react to these things as if you didn't see them coming. We do see them coming. Uh, but we need to react as a society and, as a, uh, and in our governance uh, to deal with this. And the sooner you do it, the less suffering there's going to be. Uh, and so that's why it's appropriate to do it now, even though we're, the, the impacts are still very mild, really. It, it's not much. It's just that we see it coming. And it's time to deal with it now. So what can we do about it? Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this. This could be, a, you could spend a, a whole semester of uh, talking about this and, and studying this, and there's all kinds of stuff going on now, but I just wanted to mention it because, you know, what can we do about it? We can't really live like this. Maybe a few of us can. Um, but I think the ideal adaptation at this point lies with higher education. And it's why I'm stoked to uh, occasionally be a lecturer at Humboldt State and to get a chance to talk to you today is that um, highly educated um, environmental engineers, hydrologists, wetland ecologists, mangrove foresters, uh, and so on. Uh, this, this is what we need. We need uh, uh, educated young people who will be inheriting these problems uh, that are fully spun up on this and all the, the great range of solutions that there are to it. If you just leave it to the guys that pour concrete and steel, you're not going to like what happens. Okay, that's the default situation is a bring out a bunch of scrapers and a bunch of concrete and big build walls. Um, and they won't they won't last. Um, and, and they're not an ecological solution. They're definitely part of the solution uh, in, in places, but they're not the whole solution. Um, and so we really need the, the well-educated young people to engage this. So there's three classes of, res uh, uh, of responding, basically. You can retreat, get out of there, relocate. Uh, this is kind of the obvious one. This will be necessary in many cases. But you can accommodate in various kinds of ways, or you can resist. And there's soft resistance, like a mangrove forest or a tidal wetland, and there's hard resistance, like big giant sea walls. This is a, a, an example of accommodation, but this is hardly practical for many people. Although there's people in Southeast Asia that live like this. It's kind of amazing. Um, Sacramento, uh, for example, it, uh, is, is far from the coast. Um, but it is very low lying and is highly vulnerable. It's protected by a thousand miles of earth levees. If those earth levees weren't there, Sacramento would be underwater right now. Uh, and again, those levees are very vulnerable and in bad condition. Uh, and so this is a, a real concern for even a city that's as far inland as Sacramento. Hamburg, Germany is uh, 70 miles or something up the Elbe River, but it's very low lying and it's very vulnerable. So you don't have to be right on the coast if, if you're on a river uh, that is uh, coastal. Redwood City, California, uh, a lot of this is built on fill, uh, and it's just a few feet above sea level. This is fairly valuable real estate. So we have some big problems there. Uh, the South Bay of uh, San Francisco is susceptible to flooding of all sorts. Uh, if pretty much everything else around here is a Silicon Valley. It's completely built out. Um, but there's still some remaining areas that can be developed here, uh, but developing them doesn't appear to be at all wise. Uh, they have uh, real problems there. This is what happens on the Embarcadero now uh, at high tide. Uh, at peak tides, uh, it, it comes over. Uh, and so they have a little bit of a problem there in the, uh, that part of San Francisco to deal with. This is Galveston. It has, uh, you know, Galveston wouldn't even exist. It would have sunk under the ocean uh, some time ago. Uh, but they built a giant uh, seawall that's 10 miles long and 17 feet high. Now, this won't last. The city is still sinking fast, and uh, sea level is rising. And so Galveston has a, a, a big problem. But this is how they've dealt with things so far. And then if you really want to know how to live below sea level, you go talk to the Dutch. <laughs> This is the Dutch Delta Works. Uh, it was intended to reduce the risk of flooding of a stable ocean uh, to once in 4,000 years. So it's the 4,000 year design. Um, and this, uh, this is the largest section of it. I can't say uh, the word, but um, it's protecting a large bay from sea level. Uh, this was all designed about 50 years ago. And the, the Dutch really did figure it out. Uh, you know, most of Amsterdam is a meter or two below sea level. And they figured out how to do it. They had a lot of money. 
you know, uh, the Dutch are very wealthy, and so money was really no object if your, you know, your premier city of trade is going underwater. Uh, but they've really learned how to deal with it uh, with all sorts of methods. This is visiting in, uh, in the Netherlands, um, and so the levee and the road and the buildings uh, each achieve a higher elevation. Uh, and so it's set up, their planning is all set up to deal with this. Uh, and so they can deal with this storm surge even with very considerable sea level rise. This is the giant uh, harbor gate, so that it's see, uh, storm surge barriers at Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, and it's kind of a wonder of the world, really. Uh, and it's a fabulously expensive structure. Uh, obviously, it can open and close. Um, and it was planned for the 10,000 year storm uh, with the, all this water coming down three rivers in Europe. Uh, and it allowed for about one foot of sea level rise. Um, they figured that, that, that the ocean was already rising and, and they planned for that. But if you get more than one foot of sea level rise, they're going to have to modify even this. Um, and so, you know, if you want to look at adaptation on a big scale, you can look to the Dutch. But you can only really do the Dutch thing if you have hundreds of billions of dollars. So they kind of helicoptered into the Mekong Delta and did a whole plan. And the Vietnamese looked at that and go, oh, sure. <laughs> They don't begin to have the money to do what the Dutch have done, and so they have to do something else. So, um, but anyway, there is the technology that's uh, been developed over time. Uh, it, just taking a very quick look at ecologically, there's a thing called the coastal squeeze. So as sea level rises, uh, most of the organisms and habitats can easily migrate. You know, they know how to do that. Uh, and so they'll simply migrate if there are no obstructions and occupy a new place. Fine, no problem. Except if there's something in the way, then they get squeezed out of existence. And in many cases, there is something in the way. So it's a road or a dike or somebody's house or something like that. And these habitats basically get squeezed out of existence. There's nowhere to migrate to. And so one of the adaptations is to try to give these places, give these uh, habitats uh, and organisms that live there some place to go uh, when the level of sea, uh, the ocean changes. Um, and to just kind of wrap this up, I wanted to talk about mangroves and tidal wetlands. Now, we don't have mangroves here. Mangroves is a type of forest. There's about 12 different species of trees that can grow uh, in salt water. Uh, it's a, quite a trick. Um, but they only grow in the tropics. We don't have them here, unfortunately. Um, and if you can uh, get them to grow and keep them, um, they, they really provide quite a lot of protection for your coastal areas, um, up to a point. But they're, they're a great, great protective thing. And there's a lot of uh, recognition now of the value of mangroves and a lot of conservation efforts trying to preserve the mangroves. We've lost them in a bunch of areas to shrimp farming. So they exist in the same place where it's really great to do shrimp farming. And we have such an appetite for shrimp, everybody does. The shrimp really makes a lot of money. And so a lot of mangroves have fell to shrimp farming. Uh, but there's a lot of efforts now. It's a big effort in Vietnam, and the World Bank just about to really juice it up to try and conserve the mangrove forests because they're super adaptive in terms of coastal protection, and they also store lots and lots and lots of carbon. So they're great for storing carbon and sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere and holding it for long periods of time. In our area, we have these coastal wetlands. And they're not going to do much good on the wave slope, but on the bay, um, these kinds of things are, are quite protective. And so these are like bio uh, adaptations. Uh, and we need to get good at using them and deploying them, and hopefully having the kind of uh, societal decisions uh, that will keep these in place. You've probably seen the stories of the huge losses of coastal uh, wetlands in, uh, in the Mississippi Delta, and how that made Hurricane Katrina impacts much, much worse. So here's my. Uh, anti-despair six-word story. Uh, we're adaptable, we'll be okay. Um, there's, there's a Swedish philosopher in Oxford named Nick Bostrom who looks at existential threats to humanity. What could, what could completely wipe us out? This is probably not one of them, okay? It could be really awful. And I'm not apologizing for the awfulness in any way, but it probably won't eliminate humans from the face of the earth, okay? I'm, I'm looking for an upside here. <laughs> It's probably not an existential threat to humanity. It's just a threat in a thousand other ways to humanity's well-being and the well-being of all of our ecosystems and whatnot. I think you say, well, the Earth doesn't care. It doesn't really, but we, we care, and all of the things that live here care. So, um, so I'll go through these uh, six words. Seas are rising, get ready now. The operative word is now. Land rises and falls, affecting sea level. We have that kind of dialed now. We know what's going on here, uh, but you have to know that, or you don't know how vulnerable you are. Sea level rise is slow, earthquakes are fast, but they basically can result in the same kinds of inundations of the coastline. Uh, in fact, interestingly, the tsunami hazard zones are about the same as the sea level vulnerability zones. They're basically an elevation band. So uh, if you look at the tsunami hazard zone, or if you see a tsunami 
hazard sign, it means you're also in the sea level uh, vulnerability area. We live in a sweet spot. We're used to living in a climate and a stable sea level uh, that is as good as it gets, and we're used to that. And wasn't it great that we had that and we developed civilization, whatever you think of civilization, uh, during that time because the conditions were so good. And now that's changing. And I, I mention this because I don't think we know how good we had it or had it. So uh, the ice sheets are melting and collapsing. The unknowns abound. This is a huge area of research um, and very, very important. Uh, sea level rise is slow and long. So this is going to be going on for hundreds of years no matter what we do. Even if there was, say, an energy miracle and we didn't put any more CO2 at all in the atmosphere or any other gases, greenhouse gases, sea level rise is going to continue for a long time hence because of what we've already cooked into the system. The general coastlines inundate, steep ones much less. Coastal features are young and vulnerable. The bay wants to grow. We should let it. Anticipated change makes for less suffering. We're adaptable. We'll be okay. And I'll close with this. You've seen this before. Higher education is the key to adapting to this, to understanding it and to dealing with it, to mitigating it and to adapting to it depends on highly educated people like you. So over to you. It's, that's really what we need and um, it's, it's why I like doing curriculum development and um, I don't want to uh, overburden you with responsibility, but this, this is yours to fix. So thanks for listening.